Okay, so just to get started, I did see the pictures that you had in Pecha Kucha, and when I saw the picture of your father, I thought that was you. You probably have heard that all your life. I have heard that all my life. In fact, just I told you we just ran into Mark Butot, and he commented, uh, you know, because he hadn't seen me in 50 years, he says, you know, I thought it was your father when you walked by, you know, type of thing. So, uh, yeah. I certainly do resemble him. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So um, today is Sunday, September 15th, 2019. My name is Nicole Morin Scribner as the interviewer. And today I have the honor of interviewing uh, Spiris Dragidis. Did I say yes, you did. that correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So we'll start at the beginning. Can you tell me? Um, uh, when and where you were born? I was born on March 31st, 1952, at the Weber Hospital in Biddeford. Uh, if I could give you a little anecdote about before I was born, uh, my parents were, at the time were living in Old Orchard Beach, and there was a big blizzard in February of 1952, and my mother was getting pains like she was about to have me. I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest child. So there's a so a picture of my father pulling my mother on a toboggan that was in the local newspaper, but I have not been able to find it. But anyway, we, I remember my parents telling that story. They got, you know, up to the main road in Old Orchard Beach, and he got, they were able to get to the Weber Hospital, and it was a false alarm. So, but I remember hearing that story, and supposedly there was an article, but I have yet to been able to, be able to find that. So anyway. Well, that would uh, so be I was almost fun. born in, in the end of, of uh, February, but I was ended up I was March thirty first. Huh. Um, so you have a very interesting story about how your family came to Biddeford. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some more about yes. that? Yes. Uh, uh, since coming back to Biddeford, I've been living here. I'm in the fifth year since being away uh, for almost forty years. Uh, I've been asked to give a, some talks on my family uh, running a restaurant in Biddeford, so I decided to do a little research as to why Greeks came to Biddeford. My, I'm of Greek descent, and I learned that my grandfather, Spiros Dragidis, same name, I was named after my grandfather, of course, uh, and grandmother came here in the early 1900s. My grandmother was a vassal or vassalopolis, and her brother ran a candy store on Main Street in Biddeford called the Sugar Shack, or the, excuse me, the Sugar Bowl, and it was where the Pepper, the old Pepperell Bank is in that block, and he ran a candy store. Supposedly, they came to visit uh, him, and uh, one thing led to another. They started having a family, and I guess they, they ended up having eight kids, uh, they didn't have, they in fully intended to go back to Greece, but once they got settled here, they decided to stay. So my, grand, my, my father and his brothers and sisters and grandparents lived on Foss Street in Biddeford. And I've learned that my grandfather had a shoe repair place uh, right at the Puritan Place, 115 Main Street, which was a block away. And then the, the Greek church was on Emory Street, which is a block uh, east. So within three blocks were where they lived, where they worshipped, and where his business was uh, right on Main Street. Shoe shop, and shoe shining, and shoe repair. So, so that's sort of how they came. Uh, now growing up in Biddeford, I always thought that the Greeks came here to run the restaurants because, you know, the, the Wonder Bar, which is the business my family ran, started and, and operated, was obviously Greek owned. The Puritan, the White, uh, Castle, I think it's the White. Yes, the White Castle. Uh, all the f hot dog and hamburger stands and French fry places and Orchard Beach and pizza places. Uh, right now, Alex Pizza and George's Italian are all Greek run. So I thought they came here to, but I've learned from my research that they actually did come here to work in the mills initially, and then decided to branch off into other businesses. Uh, and uh, and the three main areas that many Greeks, not only in, in New England and Biddeford, but throughout the country, got into were, were either candy stores, uh, shoe shops, shoe repair, or restaurants, or diners and then restaurants. And my family seems to have touched all those bases. Uh, so anyway, uh, that, that's how they came. And um, 
Uh, my father was born in 1912 in Biddeford. He was the fourth child. Charles Stragitis was his name. Now, in terms of your grandparents, do I understand correctly that both your grandfather and his wife, his grand, your grandmother, mm -hmm. came over together? Yes, they did come over together. That's another part of my research. Initially, actually it was at the urging of the Greek mm -hmm. government because the economy in Greece in the 1880s to 1920s was, was failing. And the Greek government actually urged young men to leave the country and find employment elsewhere. Uh, and many of them came to the United States or other parts of Europe, made money and, and sent it back to Greece to help out the family. And I, I've read in some instances to provide dowries for their sisters so they could get married. Uh, and some would, would, you know, after settling in the United States to say, well, I'm ready to get married. Can you send me somebody from the village uh, to marry? So they were sort of these arranged weddings. But my understanding is both my, my grandparents came here together, yes. Now, do you know why Bitterford? I mean, in leaving Greece and coming to the U.S., yeah. why here? Well, uh, once again, according to my research, many of the Greeks that came here uh, obviously settled in the big cities in New York, Boston, Chicago, even Cal in San Francisco, uh, or they came to New England to work in the mills. Uh, in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, you know, Lowell, Mass, Haverhill, uh, Dover, New, New Hampshire, and Biddeford at the time was, you know, a big industrial area. So they settled in Biddeford, Portland, and, and Lewiston. Uh, and in fact, I believe the first Greek church in Maine was the one on Emory Street. It later moved to Adams Street, and now it's in Saco. But it was, and and it makes sense since Biddeford was the larger largest city coming north into Maine that they probably settled. And the the, the first uh, um, mill town in in southern Maine that they settled here, and then others moved to Portland and then Lewiston. But uh, so the first church was in in Biddeford. It kind of makes you wonder that back then there wasn't the level of communication that we have today that someplace in Greece, how they would even know that a New England has all these textiles and yeah. that Bitterford is one of those premier places yeah, for that. Yeah, I, I, sure, letter writing and, I, and my, there, uh, the, a lot of the Greeks around here sort of came from the same part of Greece, so it's sort of... You know, if you know people and you, you understand that another family has moved to Biddeford, well, you know, and you know them, there's a comfort to moving to where there's a community. And I think that was probably part of it as well. Uh, it was in southern Greece, the more agricultural area called the Peloponnese, that is where they were growing currants and other products. Uh, and and the, I don't know if the crops went bad or because of competition, whatever, the industry was failing, the agricultural industry, and that's when they were urged to, to... But they weren't educated people. Many of them were farmers that came here. That was the other question I always had, was whether my grandfather knew how to repair shoes. Shining shoes probably, you know, didn't take much, but repairing shoes. Uh, and my because my grandfather on my mother's side, my mother grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, which is another mill town. Uh, he was a shoe repair person as well. Uh, so I don't think, and I don't think they knew how to, necessarily knew how to cook uh, in Greece either. Uh, you know, so they came here and they found what needed to be done. And like I said, it was either candy making, restaurants, or shoe repair. So. I don't think they had these skills in, in, in Greece, is what I'm saying. They, they came here and they, they realized this is something that, you know, there was a niche to be done. So do you know if there was a Greek community prior to your, here, prior to your grandfather coming? Or was he well, like one of the first waves? I think he was probably about in the middle because, uh, and I don't know for, well, if you go to the Greek cemetery in Biddeford, there are some tombstones that are just in Greek, whereas my grandparents, who died in the, my grandmother in 1935, my grandfather in 1942, that's all. It was all in English. So, the tombstones that are printed in Greek, Greek it must have been obviously er, uh, the first wave. According, once again, according to the research I did, it was between 1880 and 1920 
that the wave came to the United States, and they came in the early 1900s, in, you know, 1906 and 1907 time frame. My oldest uncle, my Uncle Jimmy, was born in 1907, so we do know that they were here then because he, his birth, uh, his obituary said he was born in Greece. My Uncle Archie, who was the second born, was actually born in Dover, New Hampshire, and a cousin of mine uh, sent me the census from 1910 in, from Dover, and my grandmother lived with her cousin in Dover with 14 other people in an apartment, and she was listed as a domestic cook. So they, uh, uh, my grandmother moved to Dover for a short period of time. She had already had my Uncle Jimmy here. She had my Uncle Archie there, and she worked as a cook. Maybe my grandfather was just starting up his business. You know, I don't know the, what the circumstances were, but my father, my, my Aunt Zoe was the next in line, but my father, and she was born in Biddeford, and my father was born in 1912, and he was born in Biddeford, so she was obviously ba back here, and, and the rest of the four kids were all born in Biddeford. But there was a time that she was in Dover. I, I forget what your question was, but I don't know, I thought that was interesting. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about uh, your father and his experience in Biddeford. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you, you get much of this from our generation. Our parents didn't really say much about their growing up. And I attribute it, I think, partly to growing up during the Depression. We know it was hard for them. And also World War II. So I, I, I think a lot of them you sort of wanted to look forward. And getting an education was very, for me and my brother and sister, was very important because they didn't have the opportunity to get an education. He was born in 1912. He went through school. He, he played football uh, for Biddeford High School. Uh, supposedly, he said, he always said he was uh, an all-state offensive lineman, uh, but I've tried to Google that and I haven't found that information. But I do know he played with a guy by the name of Nat Pierce, who was from Biddeford who went on to Fordham University and was one of the seven blocks of granite with um, uh, uh, Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach from, from the Packers. Uh, so my father played with this guy, Nat Pierce. Uh, I do, he always used to say he had a football scholarship to play football in, in North Carolina, but this was in the 1920s during the Depression, and uh, my grandfather said, no, you're staying and working at the, at the shoe shop. They all, my grandfather also had a shoe, shoe store in Old Orchard Beach that was just seasonal. And I have a picture of my father in the shoe store with my two uncles. Uh, so, and, and somebody recently told me, oh, my cousin told me that so when people would bring shoes uh, to the shoe store in, in Old Orchard Beach, they would wrap them up at the end of the day and take the trolley car to Biddeford and that's where they would be repaired at the, you know, shoes that needed re repair in Biddeford, and then they would trolley them back down to Old Orchard Beach. Uh, I should say in 19, and this is a little off for my father, but I'll get back to him. In 1923, I found an article. I told you my grandfather was on Main Street, 115 Main Street. There was an article that said he bought the business, two businesses on Washington Street, 1214 Washington Street, because he was on Main Street in, in, in Biddeford, uh, next to a, a store called Boucher's Variety that owned the, 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 uh, uh, the business, or the uh, uh, block, I guess. Uh, not the block, but the building, I should say. Uh, he had to leave that because they wanted to expand the variety store, so he had to look for another property. So he bought 1214 uh, Washington Street one was one of the businesses was a grocery store run by Joseph Carrier. If, if you went to Biddeford High School, you remember Mr. Carrier. It was his grandfather that ran the grocery store. I've spoken to Mr. Carrier about that. And, and then there was a livery, a, a, a uh, horse, you know, where they would uh, make harnesses and stuff for horses. This is the 1920s when there were still horse and buggies riding around. So anyway, he bought that. Uh, uh, business and that's where they he moved his shoe repair place and the family lived upstairs so this is in the, in the 1920s so anyway my father went to Biddeford High School couldn't go to college he worked at this shoe place in 1935 
My grandmother had tuberculosis, and she was up in Hebron at the at sanitarium, and she died in 1935, which was once again during the Depression. That was the year my father, Charles, and my uncle, Archie, decided to uh, start a, a restaurant. And it was just a the bar side of the Wonder Bar, and they just served beer and made sandwiches. And so, and it was initially called Charles's Cafe. Uh, uh, it eventually, my Uncle Archie was in Boston, and there were two stories. Either he bought the Wonder Bar, I don't know if you remember the long bar on the men's side. Uh, it was like a 40-foot mahogany bar. He either bought it or won it in a card game. I don't know which story is true. So anyway, uh, and they decided, my, another uncle said, they should call it the Wonder Bar, because it's a wonder bar, you know, wonderful bar. So that's when they changed the name to the Wonder Bar. Uh, a few years later. Uh, so my father's, you know, and he was only, if he was born in 1912, in 1923, no, no, 1935, he was uh, 22, 23 years old. So he and his brother started the business at, at that age and had it as a restaurant. And it initially served just uh, sandwiches and served beer. Uh, but as I said, my grandparents and my other uncles and aunts lived above. My, my aunt, Zoe, would make Greek dishes and bring them down to my uncle to eat. And the, and the other customers would say, hey, what's that? How come you don't have that on the menu? And that's when they decided to expand the menu to make it more of a restaurant. So, and that was, would have been in the 40s dur during the war, as, as I understand it. So. Um, so, like I said, he started it very young, and uh, it was his life. He, um, so. Yeah, I, I want to come back to that, but yeah. you said something that got my attention. You said the bar on the men's side. What's yeah. the men's side? I, and I don't think it was meant to be a, a sexist thing, but I think, and it wasn't that women, women were obviously allowed, and it, but you wouldn't typically, back in those years, have women sort of, drinking at a bar alone. So they, they, that's what they called it. They, the, the bar side, which was the bar and two rows of uh, bo 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 booths, and then there was a round table uh, that you could sit in. On the, when they expanded the restaurant in 1950, uh, early 50s, 51, 52, there was the dining area, and that was sort of the, the restaurant. But yeah, it was, it, it, they didn't have a sign that said men's side, but that was sort of the terminology used, because it was usually guys sitting at the bar drinking. <laughs> that just got my attention. Well, yeah, I wanted I, to I, find out a right, little bit Right, and more I didn't mean anything. Yeah, I don't, oh, no, no, no. yeah <laughs> and you know, it's well, a generational it, thing, too. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's what they called it at the time, and so I wanted to capture and, that. Right, right. And, and, uh, Maybe there was a little that, you know, any respectable woman wouldn't be drinking on the, on the, on that side type of thing. So anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble for that. No, for sure. <laughs> you're just, you're just relating what, what, what existed the history, at the right, time. right, exactly, yes, yes. exactly. So there was uh, one thing that I saw, I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but you mentioned something about <clears throat> your father going to clean up after Pearl Harbor. Yes. Uh, he always said that after Pearl Harbor, uh, they initially start recruited, he, he claimed from New England, people to volunteer to be sent to Hawaii to, to clean up the, the, the bombing. So that's where he served the country. He, he didn't join any branch of the service, but he was stationed there for a couple of years. Uh, to you know, cleaning up. Now I do have three uncles: my uncle Alec, my uncle Bill, and my uncle Ted, who were all in the army at the time and, and served in the war. And my uncle Jimmy and Archie were older, so they they didn't. I don't know if they had a draft then, but but they didn't. And they ran the restaurant. And it was in that time frame that my aunt Zoe would bring down uh, food that the customers said, you know, maybe you should have this type of food. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, he, it was right after Pearl Harbor um, that my father was sent to Hawaii. Yep. So how did your parents meet? You know, I'm wondering if it was one of these, I, I want to say arranged. It wasn't 
Uh, my mother was from Nashville, New Hampshire. My uncle John Janopoulos, who was married to her, my mother's sister, was a paper salesman, and he traveled through New Hampshire and uh, Maine. And my guess, my thinking is he may have told my father, you know, my 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 wife's sisters, you know, quite a catch, so you may want to meet her. So I think that's probably what happened. It was through the sort of the Greek network, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you ever hear from your parents? That, did they maintain a connection with any? You, you, did you still have family in Greece? In Greece, distant cousins. Uh, and on my mother's side, I don't believe anybody on my father's side went back to Greece, as, as far as I can recall. Any of their, his siblings, maybe some of the cousin, you know, the younger generation. But my, mo my mother's side, they would go back to Greece, and my cousins on my mother's side would go, like, in the summer to work at camps or whatever. So they maintained a little bit more of a connection. My grandfather initially, his, he was from Zankithos, which was an island on the west, western side of Greece, and then they moved to the mainland, and my mother's side was from the north western part of Greece. So they were from a similar section of, of Greece, all in this Peloponnesus area. But my, my, my mother, till the day she died, said, you know, someday we're going to get back to Greece, and we, she never did. She never did. Now, my wife's trying to get me to go. I've never been, so we've been working on a trip to go. Hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, now uh, what your mother did for work. Okay. I know she was a secretary at one of the mills in, in Nashua, and uh, when she got married, she was a homemaker. She raised us. But once we were all in school, oh, I'll give you one anecdote. She came up with the, what, it wasn't called the bake sale, it was the cupcake sale or something, where it was to raise money for the school, where uh, families were asked to bring a dozen cupcakes, and then they would all buy each other's cupcakes. And that was at Emory School uh, on Emory Street. And uh, so she was involved in that. And then she later became a secretary for the principal at Emory School. So that's what, but you know, she just graduated from high school in, in Nashua. And I, like I say, no, she worked in, as a secretary and then as a secretary for um, the principal at Emory School. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your childhood okay. experiences. So okay. where did you live? Uh... Okay, as I said, when my parents had me, I was, they were living in Orchard Beach. But very shortly after that, because I remember living on the corner of Amherst and May Street. It was a white house. Our landlords were Joe and Mary Tatone. We lived on the, uh, on the second floor and they lived on the bottom floor. Uh, so I remember going to Mayfield. I remember my babysitter there. Her name was Lorraine. I remember walking to school. So, and I don't, Bradbury Street School and Wentworth Street School stick in my mind, but I don't remember what gr grades I went to in either of those schools, or even if I went to both of those schools, because I, but they were like a, two rooms, schoolhouses, if I remember correctly. Uh, so we lived on, on that corner. Um, I do remember we later went to, I later went to Washington Street School, and that would have been second, third, and fourth grade. I may, maybe I'm wrong, but I remember Washington Street School because I went to school there and I would have to go to Greek school at the Greek church on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So when school let out, I would walk up to Adams Street and go to Greek school, which was uh, taught by the Greek priest. And he was an older man who didn't speak English very well. So, but it was, a try, it was an attempt to try to get us to learn the language. Now I should say, being the oldest one, my parents always used to say, they spoke Greek to me when I was little, and so I spoke a little Greek. But when I got five, six years old, when I went to school and went off playing with other kids, 
I sort of lost it. My experience was that the kids whose grandparents were still living with them uh, uh, spoke Greek a lot better because they had to communicate with their grandparents. So anyway, I would go to Greek school, and that ended like at 4.30, and then I'd walk down to the Wonder Bar, and I'd wait for my uncle Alec, who, who, who opened the restaurant at like 7 o'clock in the morning and served breakfast, and he worked all day till about 5, and he would give me a ride home. So, and that was the second, third, fourth grade when I was at uh, uh, Washington Street School. Then I remember going to what we used to call the junior high, although it wasn't the junior high then because I was in fifth grade, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, because Biddeford uh, had 7th, 8th, and 9th as the junior high, and that was at the Martin Center now, which was the, the high school when my father went, and it was the junior high school when I went. So I was there for a long stretch from 5th from, uh, grade to ninth grade. I was at that school. Now, I should say I was born in 52. My brother George was born in 55, and we were still living on, uh, on May Street, on Amherst Street. Uh, and then my sister Donna was born in, three years later, so that would be 58. And the apartment, I think it was only a two-bedroom apartment. So my parents bought the house that we grew up in, which is on Bergeron. It was called Bergeron Circle at the time. Now it's called Bergeron Lane, I think, which is uh, West Street and Granite Street in, in, in that area. So, so we moved there in maybe 59, I'd say, 59, 60. Uh, and I remember walking home from the junior high school. I'd get a ride there. Either I'd get a ride with my uncle or my, maybe I took the bus, but I would walk home and I'd walk to Granite Street and then uh, uh, walk home. And the other thing I remember growing up was there was all these corner stores. There was one on Granite Street, sort of like a raised market, which is still there. But a lot of those, corner stores are gone. There were car corner stores and barber shops sprinkled all the way throughout, the, you know, in like little neighborhoods, almost like a big city having, you know, local grocery stores. And those are few and far between now, unfortunately. So anyway, so let's see, growing up. So then I went through, I do remember fifth grade was the, 1963 was the year that John Kennedy was assassinated. And I remember we were sitting in fifth grade class and they came on the announcement that we were all being sent home and we were all quiet as, very quiet walking out and the principal, I think his name was Mr. Hodge, who was a tough principal. He was standing at the top of the stairs right by the gym where you would you know, look down at the gym and he had tears rolling down his eyes. I'll never forget that, uh, leaving that school and seeing this tough guy with tears coming down his eyes. So that was, uh, so that was in 1963. Um, and then, like I said, I went there through ninth grade and then went to the high school. Um, so now I should also say from the time I was seven or eight years old, I was working at the Wonder Bar. We, we, well, I talked, we talked a, bit, a little bit about my father starting the restaurant. Uh, another interesting tidbit that I found out, I didn't know this, but it, and it's been confirmed talking to other people, I guess after World War II, all these soldiers, men came back from war and maybe were having trouble uh, with what is now PTSD and finding employment. So there was a lot of drinking and Biddeford banned alcohol in the late 40s. And so the, the Wonder Bar wasn't, I guess, doing as well. My uncle and my father bought the Bachelder Hotel, which was on West Grand Avenue on Old Orchard Beach and ran that for a few years. The ban ended in the late 40s. They, when they sold the restaurant, they had money to, to come back and renovate the Wonder Bar and make it into uh, what, the, what the building looks like now, where they had the, the, the dining areas and bar on the first floor, and they had the three banquet rooms upstairs. Uh, and if you look at the Wonder Bar building now, it says Dragitas 1952, which happens to be the year I was born. Uh, so that's when they renovated with the proceeds from selling the Bachelor Hotel. Um, I have pictures. My cousin Spencer, who is Alex's son, was born in December of 51. I was born in March of 52. The first party in the banquet room was our christening uh, you know, celebration. So that was up on the second floor at the Wonder Bar. 
So that, so I backtracked talking about my christening. Uh, so, but I worked in the Wonder Bar from when, since I was a little guy. My, I would sit with my Uncle Jimmy and see tape people, and he had me run the cash register. Of course, he'd be over, looking over my shoulder to make sure I was putting in the right numbers and giving the right change. So I did that later. It, and how old were you? When I was you were seven or eight years old. Yeah. They thought I was cute, I guess. I don't know. Just a little kid, you know, seating customers. And then I became a bus boy throughout junior high school and, and high school. Uh, and then I went off to college and I didn't work in the restaurant uh, uh, between my college year summer vacations. I worked for uh, a lawyer in town, Ted Gollin. I don't know if you're, he was former mayor for a year. Uh, and I searched titles for him. I would drive to uh, Alfred at the courthouse and he did a lot of real estate uh, work. So I would search titles. So I did that because I had designs on going to law school. And so I thought, well, I'll look for, work for a lawyer and I'll try to learn some, some part of it. Um, so I didn't work in the restaurant then. But I, uh, I graduated from high school in 1970, and I was lucky enough to get into Bowdoin College. So I went to Bowdoin for four years. And it was at the end of my junior year that a friend of mine talked me into staying the week between when school ended and graduation and the alumni weekend, because there's a lot of things that young men probably shouldn't be doing going on there. So I stayed and we had a great time. But at alumni weekend, uh, my friend introduced me to a guy that worked for Senator Muskie. And I was starting to get interested in politics. It was during Watergate. And I should, in my junior year in high school, I went to Durago Boys State. Uh, and that uh, really interested me, interested me. I was even made uh, president of the Senate, which was kind of cool. And I remember coming home and being interviewed uh, by Peg Hendrickson? I think that was her name. She wrote for the Biddeford Journal. And there's a picture of me with her sitting in a booth at the Wonder Bar, and she was interviewing me about my experience being at Boy State. So anyway, I had an interest in politics, and I met this guy, Charlie Michelow, and he and he's worked for Simon Muskie, and I'll have to clarify something, but, uh, and he said, I said, boy, I'd love to come down and work for Wa in Washington. And he said, okay. So, uh, now I should say my cousin Alexis married Steve Muskie, so I'll get that out there. I didn't use that sort of connection, you know, because I had sort of forgotten all about it. But at my senior year, about two months before graduation, uh, I'm living in a house with some buddies and the phone rings and it's this guy, Charlie Michelow. And he said, hey, are you still interested in working in Washington? I said, oh yeah. And he said, well, it'll be a patronage position. Uh, which means, and I'll explain that to you, but, uh, and he said, you won't be making much money, maybe ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year. I thought I had, you know, died and gone to heaven. I was pinching myself to making $10,000 a year. So I said, oh yeah, I'd love to do that. Now, as I said, my cousin married Steve Muskie. I never pursued that, you know, with the family, but I'm sure it did hurt. But anyway, I was offered a job. And so after graduation, uh, in June of 74, I, th I remember flying down to uh, Washington in July of 74. I was probably starting on the 1st of July. Uh, but what, what struck me was back, at, uh, back in those days, if you remember, they didn't have those connectors that when you got off the plane and you went right into, you had to, they opened the door and you went downstairs and being hit with this humidity, because it was the, July in Washington, D.C., and, I'm say, and I said to myself, what am I getting myself into? So I'll, I'll always remember that. So anyway, and I lived with a cousin who uh, was my father's sister's daughter. Who, they grew up in Orchard Beach, and she, she was about eight year, seven or eight years older than I am. She was working for the National Security Agency and lived in Silver Spring, Maryland. And so I lived with her for about a month until I found an apartment or a house that I shared with other people. So I, so I said a patronage position. I worked in the Senate chamber initially uh, checking people's credentials to get to sit in the gallery and enforcing the rules that they couldn't take notes or take pictures or talk, 
you know, they had to give their undivided attention to what the senators were talking about. And then when the Senate was not in session, I worked in Senator Muskie's office, you know, answering correspondence and stuff. Um, so, but I, can I pass on another interesting thing? I think it was interesting. So anyway, so I started in July. In August, they flew, Senator Muskie's office flew me up here, uh, and it was nice because I got to stay with my parents, but it was to, I, were to, was to pick up Senator Muskie and bring him to Bath Ironworks for a, the launching of a ship. So, uh, and I really hadn't met him, you know, much to, to talk to him. So I was a little nervous about, you know, this man had run for vice president, he had run for president, United States Senator, governor, and here this 22 year old is gonna go pick him up in Kennebunk. So a couple of Senator Muskie's staff people were at the Wonder Bar the night before, uh, including this Ch Charlie Michelo who I mentioned. And so I, I got a call, I remember I got a call from my father saying, hey, there's some musky people here, do you want to come say hi? I said, sure. So I went to the Wonder Bar, we sat on the bar side, they were having a few beers and, and uh, maybe something to eat, and I said, you know, I got to pick up the senator tomorrow, what should I do? And, and they said, oh, don't worry about it, but you know, he's, he, he likes the Washington Redskins, and they're playing a preseason game tonight in California. It's going to be on late at like 10 o'clock at night. You should probably watch the game so you can chat with him about football. And I said, okay, great. So I watched the game, you know, to 1 o'clock in the morning. The next morning I get up. Now, I had my father's car. They didn't have a car for me, so I had to use my father's car. Now, I'm about 5'7". My father was shorter than I am, a little wider. Uh, so, and it, if you remember back in those days, the seats were, were bench seats. They weren't, you know, where you could adjust each side. So here I, I pick up Senator Muskie. He gets in the car and his knees are hitting the, the, the dashboard. And he said, they always get me short drivers. And I'm saying, oh boy. So, so I said, okay, let me back up the seat. So we, we take off, we're heading up on the turnpike and I said, well, Senator, did you watch the Redskins last night? He said, nah, they're not going to be good this year. I, I, I don't follow them. <laughs> so, so then I had nothing else to talk. <laughs> so we're driving up, and he said, you know, they haven't told me anything about this boat that's being launched. And I said, I'm sorry, they didn't tell me anything either. So he takes out an envelope out of his coat pocket, and he's jotting down some notes. And I'm saying, oh, because they always compared him to Abraham Lincoln being a tall statesman like and it's always writing the next Gettysburg address so we get to Bath and Governor Curtis was there and Peter Kairos was the congressman and they all got up and they all essentially gave the same speech about Maine seafaring heritage and how important the, the boating industry was to Maine and all that so uh, but the one thing I do remember about the launching was that John Wayne was also there and when the boat you know they crashed the champagne bottle, and there was like a delay in the boat. I don't know if it was a, a, a problem or something. And John Wayne sort of lumbered over, and he put his hand on the bottle, and he pushed it, you know, just at the time that the thing was going. Who knows, maybe that was staged. But so after all that, I drove Senator Muskie to Lewiston, and his daughter Martha was uh, going as a freshman to Bates College. So I'm helping them <laughs> move her into her dorm room. And here I am with this United States Senator bringing, you know, crates up and trunks and stuff and, you know, whatever else. So that was my, my day, day with Senator Muskie, my, my first experience. Uh, and then I did later on work on his re-election campaign in 76. I drove him around, but we had gotten to know each other a little better then, so <laughs> it wasn't as... <laughs> <laughs> nerve-wracking as it was that first experience so <laughs> with after getting to know him yep. a little bit better is yep. there anything in particular that you think that people would find interesting uh, about well him I think his, his life is pretty he, he he wasn't much for small talk you know and I, I did learn on the campaign trail that you know it's it's such a grueling where you he would he would doze off in between stops, and I and I understood why because that's when you have a little chance to take a little cat nap, cat nap, because you know you you go you give a speech 
and it, it's essentially the same campaign speech that you give, and you shake a lot of hands, and it's sort of an opportunity to, to, to rest between those stops. Uh, no, but he was um, obviously very smart and a, and a very effective legislator, um, and he had a little bit of a temper at time, which I think was a was a uh, something that was you know talked about. Yeah, but uh, he was a great man, and I I really enjoyed working for him. So it must have been, or or what what was it like to transition from living in a place like Biddeford and even at Bowdoin College to Washington D.C. Well, from Biddeford to Bowdoin College was a because you know the, Biddeford's a mill town and it's a it's a working class town and you know although my family ran a business you know we didn't we had food every day but we weren't rolling in money you go to Bowdoin there's that's one thing that you notice is there are kids there with a lot of money <laughs> so there was that I did I didn't really know what a prep school was until I went to Bowdoin I found that kids could would go board at other you know at high school I, it, that was sort of a new new thing to, for me uh, the other interesting thing was my freshman year the class of 74 Bowdoin made a concerted effort to get more diversity in the class and the incoming class had 10% black kids, which I didn't know any black kids uh, growing up in Biddeford. So that was my, so it was an interesting uh, mix of people at, at Bowdoin. So that was one thing. And then obviously going from uh, Biddeford, Maine and Brunswick, Maine to the nation's capital, which is, you know, such a beautiful city, but that's another interesting thing. That was 1974. Uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 68, there were riots in many large cities, including Washington, D.C. And I remember being told that uh, the Capitol policemen at the time of 1968 were essentially other patronage jobs like mine was uh, law students at Georgetown or George Washington and they gave them a uniform to walk around to provide security. It was during those riots or after those riots that they realized maybe we should be getting a more professional uh, uh, security force and thus a lot of the, the, the uh, guards and security when I was there in the, in the mid-70s were either retired DC of police officers or military, so they had a more professional. And then after 9/11, it's you know back then you could get on the little subways that connected between the office buildings and the Senate chamber and sit next to Teddy Kennedy or or you know you name it. Uh, now it's well, there's a lot more security, uh, but but anyway. A single guy going to Washington D.C., you know, where there are a lot of young people. It was a, it was an exciting time, and it was a lot different from growing up in Biddeford, Maine. I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, so I worked for Senator Muskie for two years. I came back in 1976, worked on his reelection campaign in November. Uh, in fact, I have a picture because that was the year Jimmy Carter was elected president. And I have a picture of me sitting at Senator, I mean, Governor Curtis's house in Cape Elizabeth uh, with Jimmy Carter when he was a, uh, uh, the candidate for, for president. He, he came here to campaign. Um, and then after that, I, I worked in the Wonder Bar. My mother uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer in the early 70s when I was in college. And she was going through radiation and chemotherapy. She had had surgery. And so... I stayed in Maine to sort of help out my, with my father, you know, taking her up to Portland for treatments and stuff. Um, so I worked as a, as a bartender at the Wonder Bar. There's a picture, I don't know, of me with a beard. Per, I don't know, if, did I, is that one of the ones I sent you? No? Okay. Um, uh, so I worked that winter. I had met somebody down in Washington, and she was now studying in England, and so when she came back from school, uh, I decided to go back to Washington, and that pr 
person is my wife of 40 years this year, uh, Atali. So anyway, we, uh, uh, so I went back to Washington. I worked for Sir Muskie in his office for a little bit of time. And then I worked for Fiber Materials Inc., out of, a company out of Biddeford. I worked in their Washington office. I did that for a year. And then I heard about a job with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in their Office of Congressional Affairs. And so I applied for that job and I was hired, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and I started in January of 1979. So 1979 was a big year because that's the year I started at the NRC in January. In March was Three Mile Island, which was the worst accident in the United States, nuclear accident in the United States. So I, I had two months of experience. Uh, uh, but I should also back up, my, my wife's mother also had breast cancer and she died in, in March. Uh, and I came back from the funeral and the next day I walked into our office and I'll never forget one of my coworkers had two phones in his ears and I said, what's going on? He says, we've got a problem in Pennsylvania and that was Three Mile Island. And I said, I was in Congressional Affairs for that whole year. You know how they have congressional hearings when there are issues? We had something on the order of 85 congressional hearings from March, actually the day after the accident started, March 29th, uh, there was congressional hearings and we had them straight out, 85 of them for the, for the next 12 month period. So we, we were very busy. So that was, uh, so 1979, I, I, I started my job, Three Mile Island, my future mother-in-law had died. We got married in June. So she died three months before we got married. We got married in, in June of, um, of 79 in Spring Lake, New Jersey, which is where my wife is from. But um, we also had a Greek ceremony the night before uh, there was a Greek priest there that sort of gave a little blessing. Uh, uh, so we got married sort of in two different churches, but Greek Orthodox and Catholic are very similar. And then we got married in the, in the Catholic church the next day. And that was also during the energy crisis, if you remember. And I'll remember driving from Washington to New Jersey and cars were, that was when you had to go order even numbers in your plates. And cars in D.C. were like wrapped around blocks driving up the New Jersey Turnpike. There were cars lined up all the way out onto the New Jersey Turnpike waiting in line for gas. So we got married on, in June, late June of, of 79. We, we did our honeymoon in Montreal and Quebec City. Once we got north of New York City, there was no lines. Canada, there was plentiful gas. It was an experience. It was only in this sort of corridor. So... Anyway, so that was a big year, 79. Um, let's see, my, our first daughter was born in, in March of 81. And I should also tell you, to, so she was born in March of 81. In March of 82, my father, it was her one year birthday, my father came down from Maine and we had a great week. We went out to dinner, we went to the museums, we walked with, with Mary, our baby. Uh, and that was in early March. He came back at the closing to sell the restaurant in 1982. It was where the old Bangor Savings was, which was the Pepperell Bank, which was their bank up in their conference room. My father was signing the papers to sell the restaurant with his three brothers and he had a heart attack and he died. Uh, like a week to 10 days after he had come to visit us. So he had lost, his, oh, I should have said that my mother died in 81 of, of breast, she finally succumbed to breast cancer. So she died in 81 and about a year later, uh, uh, no, she died in 80, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, like less than two years later, he died in 1982. Uh, but we did sp get to spend a great week with him before, you know, I just think, you know, his wife died, he was selling his business that he had been doing since 1935, since he was 22 years old. Um, you know, there was, it was all, probably all too much for him. And it was 1969. No, he was 69, I should say. He was about to turn 70 in April. Yeah. Now, did you say he had the heart attack when he was signing the papers? Yes. Yep. Yep. 
or you know maybe in the conference room, maybe right after that or something. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I don't want to be more, I don't know what the right word is, but my cousin Spencer tells me the story that he gets the call from his, his father, my uncle Alex, saying, well, I get some good news and bad news. The good news is we sold the restaurant. The bad news is Charlie died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's really something. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. But like I said, that week that we had together was a great week. You know, it was it was great, uh, and it was a heart attack. So it was, you know, it was, no, neither death is great, but seeing how much my mother suffered for seven or eight years with going through breast cancer, you know, maybe a heart attack is, you know, better way to go. <laughs> so you continued to live in the Washington D.C. area. Yes, after yes, that? yes. So we had we had an apartment on Capitol Hill when we had Mary. And then, three years later, our, our da twin daughters, Christina and Elizabeth, were born in 1984, in January of 84. So we went from one kid to three kids in an apartment. So that forced us, we were thinking in the back of our heads, we gotta start looking maybe at buying something. We didn't, at the time, the public schools in Washington weren't great. So we knew we probably would have to move out to the suburbs somewhere. And so that, once we went up to three kids, we decided, well, we better get more serious about it. And we ended up moving to Bethesda, Maryland, which is in suburban DC, uh, in Montgomery County, which has a very good school system. So, and then my wife, oddly, was pregnant with daughter number four. We didn't know it was a girl. Uh, we, we moved in no, uh, November of 84, I think, December 1st was, well, I think the closing November, December 1st of 84, and Alexandra was born in May. If I get these dates wrong, I'll, I'll, if they listen to this, I'll never hear the end of it, in May of 85. So Alexandra was born, and we were living in uh, Bethesda, Maryland at the time. And then our son Gregory was born in September, just had his birthday a few days ago, September uh, of 1988. So we have five children. And now we have seven grandkids. And they were all here in August for a week. We had a great time. Yep. Oh, the grandkids and the kids and their husbands. Yep. Only two of our kids are married right now. Uh, the twins and Gregory are, are not married. And so you stayed and you continued your so, yeah, professional yeah, career. Right, right. So that takes us, yeah, mid-80s. We moved out. My agency for it, Thankfully, it was down in, in downtown DC, moved out to Rockville, Maryland, which is two stops taking the subway out of the city, <coughs> away from the city, I should say. So it was a very easy commute. I would get up every morning, go to the bus stop. They would take me to the National Institute of Health, NIH, and I would take the subway, the two or three stops to White Flint, which is where the NRC was. And so I worked there from 1979 until I retired in 2011. So I have, with my time with Senator Muskie, it's almost 37 years with the, I had 37 years with the federal government, you know. And I, and I worked various jobs at the NRC. I worked, as I said, in the Office of Congressional Affairs for about four years, and then I worked for, the, the NRC is a commission of five members. They're, they're appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate and they're on staggered terms. So every July 1st, a new commissioner, unless they get renom you know, renominated. So um, uh, I worked for a commissioner that had been started. He was finishing out a term, actually, of a commissioner who had been from Maine, uh, Peter Bradford. He was with the Public Utility Commission. He was appointed by President Carter and then left early. So the person, by that time, President Reagan was the president, he nominated a person who I had worked with on Capitol Hill, and he asked me to be on his staff. So I, was, I worked for him for five years, and then I worked in a different office uh, doing similar work to congressional affairs, but dealing with states and state legislatures and public utility commissions, and that was the Office of State Programs. That was my longest time at the NRC. And then at the, after three, uh, uh, after 9-11, um, 
there was another commissioner that asked me to work on his staff, and I did that for about five years, and his term ended, and then I ended up back in congressional affairs for the last three or four years at the end. But I should say that when I was working for the first commissioner in the mid-80s, uh, we were on a trip and we went to uh, Japan and Korea and we were about to leave Japan and fly to Korea and I woke up and we were in Kyoto and the television didn't have English translation but they showed the Soviet Union with this like mushroom cloud and this glowing thing and it turned out to be Chernobyl. And I remember going down to breakfast but because we had a flight that day and I said, did anybody watch TV this morning? And nobody had. And I said, I think there's something going on at, in Russia or in, in the, the Soviet Union. And so we got on the plane and we flew to Korea and the embassy picked us up and brought us to the Korean embassy for a briefing on this early indicate the Russian or the Soviets didn't tell much about what was going on, uh, but it was the Chernobyl accident. So I, there was Three Mile Island and then Chernobyl and then near the end of my career was the Fukushima, the nuclear accident. That's when I realized, okay, well, there were two things. There was that because I said, okay, I started with Three Mile Island and I had Chernobyl in the middle. Maybe it would be good to retire after this Fukushima because, and then 9-11, which is another thing. But um, um, what was I going to say about Fukushima? Uh, well, anyway, that's when I decided. Oh, the other thing about realizing to retire, you know, you start it and you get to meet people and stuff, and then you get in the elevator and you know most of the people. After you've been there 35 years and people start retiring, when you get in the elevator and you don't know anybody, you figure maybe that maybe I should be the next one, you know, because all your coworkers that you sort of had your whole experience with, your whole career with, are starting to retire then you realize maybe it's time for me to retire. So th that's when I decided to, to hang it up. Hmm. And, uh, and then we decided to move back to Biddeford. What prompted you? Why well, did you want to come back to Biddeford? <clears throat> well, I remember raising the family in Maryland. Every year we would try to carve out a week or two to come up to Biddeford. And we would either stay with my sister or my brother and so my kids would get to play and go to the beach with their cousins and stuff. And every year, my wife, Atali, would say, you know, we should retire to a place that the kids will want to come visit. And what better place, at least in the summer, than Maine? In fact, I think I said uh, the whole family did come in August this year, and we had a great week together. Uh, so, and there is also a comfort to coming back to where you're from. And my wife, although she's from New Jersey, she likes the fact that we're only five miles, five or six miles to the beach. And the, the world is so much smaller now. I remember, I t mentioned that my mother was born, born in, and had family in Nashua. I remember growing up, my mother and father and the three of us in the back seat would drive to Nashua. And that drive seemed like, like eternity. It, it, you know, we would drive through Sanford and Springvale and Raymond and Dover and my father smoked cigars and the three of us would be in the back seat, you know, getting car sick and it's, you know, it seemed like a three, four hour drive. But now, you know, the world is so much smaller. You can, you know, go to Portland or, or Boston and be anywhere, you know, very quickly. So, so it's not as remote as it used to be. Uh, so we, we're loving it here. Now, did you have, coming from Biddeford and then doing the work that you did in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. did that give you any kind of impact or perspective in terms of being from here to then do the work you did where you were? Uh, I, my mother would would always, uh, she would never come downtown in Biddeford in slacks. She would always put a dress on. She always looked nice, she, you know. And I remember when somebody would drop in and she'd still be in her house coat and she'd, oh, you know, I'm not dressed. Uh, but I also remember my mother would talk to the dishwashers at the Wonder Bar 
or the, the, the maintenance people or the bank presidents. She always treated people equally. And I, and, and I always remembered that, you know. Uh, she didn't, you know, stick her nose up. She, she always, uh, and, and I, that was something I tried to, you know, people have different perspectives, they have different views, but you gotta treat them with respect and, and try to appreciate their point of view. But, so I think in my professional career, it was to try to you know, deal with everybody honestly and equally. Uh, so I think that was something from, from growing up. Um, coming back, <clears throat> Alan Cassavant, the current mayor, was my classmate at Biddeford High School. In fact, we went to Boy State together and we were on certain committees and clubs. Uh, and initially, uh, Alan asked me to be on the Downtown Development Commission, and I did that for a couple of years, I think, maybe a year and a half. And now I'm on the planning board. And as far as translating back, uh, working at the federal level, you know, there are certain rules and stuff. Uh, it, I, I'm, I'm finding it, you know, there are different rules at the local level. So I, I, I'm trying to make that transition. Uh, uh, but I think I, I hopefully I've offered some perspective having to work, you know, within the federal government um, to my colleagues and the staff there. Now, did, did you ever get any sense or feedback about how you were received in those circles coming from a from, small city in Maine? Um, you know what? The, the federal government, you know, like the military, there are rules in place, but, you know, there's a lot of diversity in the federal government. There are women in managerial positions uh, um, and, and certainly racial diverse, diversity. Uh, it, it's a lot more, getting back to the, the equal thing, it, uh, so I, I never felt like, oh, you know, a hick from, this, from rural Maine. And the other thing about the federal government, and that's the thing about Washington, D.C., which has its benefits because you have people from all over the country that work there, all over the world, which I think has its benefits. Where it has its negative is they all drive differently. So Washington's terrible as far as traffic and because, you know, in Boston they say people are aggressive, but they're all aggressive, so, you know, if there's a space, you fill it. Whereas Washington, you know, there could be some aggressive drivers, but there also could be some people that drive slower and don't get the filling. So, so that's the downside of having people from all over the world located. But, uh, but I think that the, the diversity, you know, ethnic restaurants and stuff like that, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, uh, I never felt uh, a bias or anything because I was from a small town. So I'm going to like turn the clock back a bit yep. and go back to again when you were growing up in terms of at home. Were there any uh, traditions or special meals that you can remember, particularly with regards to your ethnic background? Right. Uh, my recollection is my mother would typically make a Greek dish uh, on Sunday, either uh, um, what she called makaronadia, which were, which was was uh, uh, short ribs with with pasta, and I remember that maybe pastizio, which is a uh, like a lasagna, uh, lamb dishes. It cer certainly, as far as traditions, Easter was the big holiday in the Greek church and we would go to church like from Palm Sunday almost every day during that week on Wednesday you'd get the oil in the, on your forehead on your on your hands uh, and then Good Friday um, I was an altar boy also was in the choir at the Greek church um, and then we would go to midnight mass on Saturday night and then typically either my mother and father would host the family, uh, or my uncle Alec, or my uncle Archie, we would rotate with the ones that were married that had houses. Uh, my uncle Jimmy was single and he didn't have, but we would, on Easter, that was a, the big tradition. 
Uh, now, the Wonder Bar was open every day except Christmas. So I do remember, <clears throat> and, and I told this story recently, my father, you know, I, I, we'd go to bed and he'd be watching the Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show. We'd get up in the morning and he'd be watching The Today Show. So we never knew when he slept, but he did, had to have slept somewhere in between there. And he'd be on the phone with Bugby and Brown or Armour and Swift uh, or the fish people. And so he would make place orders or stuff, and then he would drive around and pick up stuff. Uh, the reason I tell that story is because the Wonder Bar was closed only on Christmas Day. Of course, the kids, we, we would all get up early to open presents, and that was the one day that he'd you know, decide he was going to sleep till 8, 9 o'clock. So you know, we'd have to end up waiting for him to get up. Then we'd open presents. Then he would always want to go to the restaurant just to check things out, even though it was closed. So, but. On Christmas Day, one of those uncles and aunts would host a Christmas a Christmas party, and we would typically have uh, roast lamb at either Christmas and, as I said, Easter. Um, uh, there were the Wonder Bar was famous for their Thursday lunch special, which was a baked lamb, which they served with rice pilaf. That was, and I've been to many Greek restaurants since then, and it's never quite been replicated from the way the Wonder Bar would make it. So I, I wish I really had that recipe. Um, uh, and then, you know, my mother made uh, like a rice pilaf occasionally, which was just sh a shrimp pilaf, I should say, a shrimp and rice dish. Uh, Greek salads, we pretty, tr pretty much had Greek salad every day. But my mother, you know, there were many l dinners that my father was at the restaurant, so he wasn't, but it was just my mother and the, th the three of us. Uh, but he would try to be there for Christmas, I mean for, uh, Sunday dinner, and then she would typically invite an uncle or whatever to come over for dinner. Now, when you were growing up and when you were going to school, there were other ethnic groups mm -hmm. in Biddeford. Were you aware of that? Of Other than the, the French Canadian, in fact, I, and this is probably not correct, but I was in, there were two little leagues. There was the little league that was at the Biddeford field and then there was the DeCary Little League, which was off Pool Road, uh, Pool Street, back where, I don't know what the facility is now, but it's like on the other side of the, of the Westbrook skating rink, back in there. There was a field back there, and that was the DeCary League. Uh, my brother and I played on Hebert's Superette, and I used to kid that I integrated the, the Little League because there were 89 French kids and, and me, but I'm not sure if that, there were probably Irish kids too, and, but, I, but I don't, it wasn't, we were just kids. We didn't know whether we were French or Greek or Irish or Italian, you know? We were just kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when you were, do you remember when you were in high school, what did you guys do for fun? Well, uh, Carl Olson was the first to get his license, and he had a, a black and yellow uh, Ford Falcon. It looked like a bumblebee. And we used to uh, drive up to the only McDonald's at the time, which was in Portland. Uh, it, it, it was, I don't know if it, it wasn't Zares, but there was some, it was it Zares? And then we, we, so we would drive to Portland, get a McDonald's, and then drive back. And then we would reach into our pockets and come up with 72 cents to Put, fill the gas up so his parents wouldn't know that we had driven to Portland. Of course, we never figured out the odometer, so they probably could have checked that. We would drive down Old Orchard Beach. You know, uh, we would do the, <laughs> you know, drive around. Uh, so that I remember. Now, whereas most of my classmates were, it was easy for them to go to the dances on Friday night it was like pulling teeth for me. And I, re, re, I uh, recently thought about that and figured, because I would ask my mother, can I go to the dance? And she said, well, you've got to check with your Uncle Jimmy because he's the one that did the schedule for the Wonder Bar. He says, Bec uh, you know, you may have to work. So I'd go to Uncle Jimmy and I'd say, can I take, have Friday off? And he'd hem and haw and say, well, you know, Friday's a busy day because it was a busy day because that's when the paychecks came in and people would, remember, I, I was looking at old newspapers, dollar days, people Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 
So people got their paychecks. They would go to all the beautiful department stores in Biddeford, Butler's, uh, Ulins, uh, Nichols, Fishman's, uh, Palakwich, uh, uh, the Five and Dime, Woolworths, go shopping, and then they'd go to the Wonder Bar for dinner, right? He's busy, and it's going to be busy, and so maybe one out of three or four times he'd let me take the night off, but the other times I'd have to work as a busboy. What I was thinking of recently is that was probably coordinated because, you know, a lot of parents now say, well, go ask your father or go ask your mother. Well, my mother would, or father would say, well, you've got to check with Uncle Jimmy. So it was a third thing that I had to get through. So I didn't go to as many dances as my classmates. I, I, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so when you did go to dances, where yeah. did you go? Well, I remember the high school had dances, the junior high school had dances, and then it was St. It's where the Cannon is on South Street and what St. Joseph. Joseph's Hall, right? We went to dances there. The other thing I remember in, in Old Orchard Beach was the Palace Ballroom or something. It was on West, East Grand by where there's the amusement parks now. And it was a fire trap because I remember going up wooden stairs and the, and the auditorium was up on the second floor. But it, the first rock, real rock and roll bands I saw were there. I remember seeing the Shadows of Night who had one hit called Gloria that, that uh, Van Morrison or them also did. I saw the Searchers and the Zombies and I think the Animals. Uh, which were the British invasion groups after the Beatles and Rolling Stones came. So that was a big deal to see these guys from England playing. And then the Birds, who were one of my favorite American groups, were supposed to play there and they didn't show up. And I guess they were notorious for bowing out of performances. And I, re I remember looking that up recently. They had played in Boston and I guess they decided go to Old Orchard Beach, Maine, so they decided not to go to Maine. So that broke my heart. But I, I did later get to meet one of the birds, Chris Hillman, and I missed the opportunity to tell him that how he broke my heart by not coming up to Biddeford. But anyway, uh, uh, so we used to go there. But that wasn't dancing. That was you know, a bunch of you know, teenage boys uh, uh, essentially you know, looking up at these guys playing rock and roll. <laughs> so how about sports? Did you play any sports? I played up until ninth grade, I guess, and then uh, the other kids got bigger, and uh, I decided I w it was probably not right for me. But I did play trumpet uh, growing up, and I took lessons, and I was in the band. So I played, I played in the marching band through high school. Did yeah. you go to any of the games? I'd go to the games, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a big deal. It was a big, big deal. So tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, well, the game, I mean, I, I remember standing around, you know, the bleachers were always filled, particularly Bitterford St. Louis, Bitterford Thornton, big games, and uh, people would be standing five, six deep around, around the field. The other thing that strikes me about how the climate is getting warmer, and I'm, I'm not going to get into politics, but uh, I remember I had a cousin that lived in Sanford, the, the, the uncle that introduced my father and mother. Uh, lived in Sanford, and his son went to Sanford High School, and Biddeford used to play Sanford on Veterans Day or Veterans Day weekend every year, and I remember going either to the Sanford field or the Biddeford field, because we the two families would get together to go to the game, and the, how bitterly cold it was in early November, uh, you know, uh, so... Uh, uh, now, I should also tell you, I told you my father played football. He used to... And I have seen this. In a big rivalry game against Thornton, he was a, a lineman, so he didn't normally handle the ball. But so, supposedly, he crashed through the line and stole the ball from the quarterback and had like an 89-yard run. Unfortunately, Bitterford lost that game 7-6, to six, but he did uh, score the one touchdown for Bitterford, and they didn't hit the extra point. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, but I'd, so I played in the band, but I'd, and I'd go to the games. I used to go to the basketball games too. My uncle Alec was called Curly, and he was, I guess, a pretty good basketball player back in the 30s. I guess it would be maybe 40s, probably the 40s, and no, uh, 30s. Uh, 
And I remember he and my cousin Spencer, they would pick me up and we would travel. We would go to the Biddeford Games at home at Steve White Gym, but we'd also go to the games uh, around. I remember driving to Lewiston and Portland and stuff. Yeah. So I did want to spend a little bit more time at yeah. least with uh, at the at the Wonder Bar. Mm -hmm. um, so there, who who typically went to the Wonder Bar? Tell me some about of the stories. Of okay. Well, I have a picture of my uncle Archie and, Char uh, and Alex, who typically worked the bar at a lunchtime, and you had you know people in suits and ties, e either business people or bankers or lawyers sitting there. There'd be mill workers sitting, uh, having a sandwich and a beer. Uh, there'd be St. Francis College students sitting there. So they had a wide diversity of people. And that was the uh, nice thing about the Wonder Bar, that it was welcoming to all types of people. Uh, but the Wonder Bar was also noted as a political uh, uh, establishment. And that, I understand, goes back to the days of former Mayor Papa Lozier. Papa Lozier counseled my father and my uncles and encouraged them to, you know, in, in the restaurant business. According to interviews I've read uh, from my uncles and father, either in their obituaries or whatever. And so, uh, I understand in the 40s when he was mayor, he would have city council meetings and then they would go over to the Wonder Bar and with his allies and discuss strategy or whatever. And it was back at that time that it got noted as a sort of a political hangout. And that reputation stayed through when my, uh, through when the family sold it. Uh, people either main people running for Senate or Congress or local elections would come through the Wonder Bar and shake hands. There were stories of uh, governor's offices calling my uncle Al uh, Archie, uh, or Alec, excuse me, Jimmy, saying, hi, this is you know, governor so-and-so's office. Is the governor there? You know, taking mes messages for people wanting to know if the governor or senator was there. Um, uh, I have a picture of my Uncle Jimmy sitting with Joseph McCarthy from the, from the Red Scare era, the, the senator from Wisconsin, coming to the Wonder Bar, recruiting a state, per, a, a state, rep, a state senator from Biddeford by the name of Bob Jones. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith, gave, who was a senator from Maine, gave a very critical speech on the Senate floor against this Red Scare. And in retaliation, uh, Senator McCarthy came to Maine looking to recruit somebody to run against Margaret J. Smith and recruited this Bob, Bob Jones to run against him. Uh, he failed in his attempt to, to defeat Margaret J. Smith, but there's a picture of uh, Senator McCarthy, his wife, Bob, Jones and my uncle Jimmy sitting in the, not that my uncle was involved in that, but I think it was just because it was a senator there and he was, he posed for the picture. Uh, and like I say, Bob Jones. Now, later on, Bob Jones's nephew, Freddie Jonkis, worked at the Wonder Bar uh, uh, as a cook. Uh, uh, so there was that f family connection as well. So, um, and I think I, I did mention that uh, presidential candidates, Vice, uh, I think uh, uh, Senator Mondale, who was running with Jimmy Carter, came through, as well as others. So it was a, it was a popular place to talk politics and also to have the candidates come through and shake hands because they knew that there'd probably be a lot of people there that could get a big bang for their bucks. <laughs> now, you said there was a banquet room. Uh, you showed the example. The first one was your questioning. Yeah. What, what other kind of events were there? Uh, I know like the local Rotary Club met there, other civic organizations. I know that the high schools would have their awards banquets there. St. Francis would have functions there. The other, I've met so many people since coming back to say that their parents had their 25th wedding anniversary there, as did my parents and my uncles and aunts, uh, uh, that uh, uh, 
Senator DeChambeau, who lives in one of the buildings down there, she told me she has a picture of her in her first Holy Communion white dress sitting in a booth at the Wonder Bar. It was a popular place, you know, after church for people to come have Sunday dinner uh, or to celebrate functions like that. Uh, 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 Mayor Papa Lozier had his 75th birthday party. I, there's, I have a picture of him at the head table for his 75th birthday party there. Um, so there was a lot of those, uh, oh, retirement parties. I have, I have a picture of a man who worked at the Pepperell Mill for 27 years having, so you had from mayors to bankers to mill workers having their or mill workers celebrating their anniversaries were held there, wedding anniversaries, yep. So it was a very popular place for those type of functions. And um, the room could, could seat over 200 people, or oh, weddings as well, weddings and christenings. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So your family must have been really proud to play such a prominent role in the community. Very, I, I, I think they were, although I'm not sure if they appreciated it because, you know, they were, just part of the community. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So it must have been kind of tough when the decision was made to, after all these years, to uh, pass the torch on to someone else. Yeah, uh, my father and my father's health was failing, obviously, because he, he died the day they sold the restaurant, but, uh, and his three brothers, two of them being older, so my father was 69, so they were in their 70s. Uh, Alex was in a bad car accident prior to that, and so his recovery was slow. So they, they were getting old. As I told you earlier, for me and my brothers and sisters and my cousins to go to college was very important because although it was a business that uh, supported four families, three with, with married with children and then my Uncle Jimmy, but also at one time the Wonder Bar employed over 60 people, which is a, and I think some of those are part-time that maybe worked banquets. That, that was the other thing, they do catering too. So if the hall wasn't big enough, you know, they could do it at Rochambeau or some of the other bigger halls in town. So there was a food truck, I mean a catering truck, and I have a picture of that. But um, uh, what point were we talking about? The, well, we were talking about what kind of events took place at the banquet hall. Right, yeah. right, but uh, also my fa family bring... Oh, uh, making the... Uh, passing the baton. Right, 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 right. I don't think they wanted us to go to college to, to go back and run the restaurant. So, and I don't think any of us wanted to. Although we all worked in the business, we all knew it's a grueling business. And there were four brothers. There was always one brother there at one time. I told you my Uncle Alec opened and left at four. My father would go in at around 10, work the lunch hour, leave about two. He'd go home, sleep, you know, lie on the couch from two to five, and then go back to work to work the dinner hour and go home 9, 30, 10 o'clock. My Uncle Jimmy had similar hours, and my Uncle Archie would come in at noon, work the lunch hour, go home at two, come back at five and close. So there was always a Dragitas brother there. Because you, you got to stay on top of things. You want to have a manager there at all times. Plus, you know, sometimes people take advantage of, of you. So anyway, uh, and I, so they all thought it was very important that we get educated. But, but it wasn't to get educated to, to work in a restaurant. And as I said, we, we had all worked there and we knew how grueling it could be because you're always on your feet and it's not the healthiest lifestyle. You're, you're around food. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, although my brother did work for the people that had bought it, uh, but it's changed hands several times. Mr. Keeley has run it now for like over 20 years. So, but it was 80, 90, uh, 2000. So it's been closed for, from when my fa family almost 40 years. So it's been in other people's hands for almost 40 years. So, um. Now, through time in Bitterford, yep. you know, there were a lot of ups and downs, and I'm wondering if you're, you know, how that affected the family business, you know, with the mills 
like closing and there was the mills closing and people you know losing their jobs also i attribute it to the main mall because all the locally it was a sort of a domino but uh the fact that the mills closed but also that you had these big national department stores moving into the to the mall so the aforementioned local businesses couldn't compete with those so they started closing uh that was the thing when i would come back with my family during the 80s and 90s uh in the early maybe 2000s you know biddeford had army and navy recruiting and tattoo parlors there wasn't much more you know there were a few businesses that survived but it wasn't the biddeford that i remember from the 60s and 70s so uh although as i said we'd like we really enjoyed coming to the area and staying with my family uh biddeford didn't have much to offer that's what's so exciting to me about being being back is to seeing this resurgence in biddeford now is the youngest city in maine which is amazing to me if something should happen to me it'll even be you know the the median age will drop even lower but uh it's to seeing all these young entrepreneurs sort of like my father and his brother starting a business in their early 20s you know starting restaurants and uh other businesses uh and then here at the mill uh, the people that uh make camping equipment and dresses i i i think it's terrific i i i read that that young youthful vitality and i think is exciting and i'm looking forward to biddeford continuing with that so um uh is there i've asked you a lot of questions yep. is there anything that you had wanted to make sure that we uh got out there that maybe we didn't have a chance to bring up uh i think we've covered it all let me let me think Do I have any other anecdotes? I hope I don't get in trouble for any of those. Um No, I think I think that's good. That's about it. If I can. So, as a closing question, yeah. I'd like to ask, what is something you'd want to make sure that people take away from hearing your story? Oh boy. I uh, <laughs> That's well, um Boy, I'm drawing a blank. Uh I've uh I I've enjoy, I I've enjoyed my my first 22 years pretty much living in Biddeford and I'm very happy. My wife and I are very happy to be back here as a, from what I was just saying and excited about the trajectory of how Biddeford is going because uh hopefully it's going to uh be the 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 community and the city that I remember growing up in uh after a, a long time that um uh, uh it wasn't so much that so I I I I'm very pleased to see how things are going and I'm I'm hoping in my role uh helping th- uh to help contribute with that um so that, that wasn't very articulate but that's that's my answer <laughs> I think it 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 still captures the essence of the point you were trying to make. Okay, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So thank you for taking the time to share your really interesting well, story. Well, <laughs> well, thank you.